Amen. Thank you, choir. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this window to reflect on your word this morning. May you use me to be a blessing to your people, those gathered here, and those following us online through Christ our Lord. Amen. You can take your seats. And good morning. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Uh, it's a bit cold out there, but it is warm in here. And I want to believe that even inside us, we are warm in the Lord. We want to appreciate you who made it this morning here present. And those who are following us online, I have seen that we have people following us all the way from the United States. We have people from Isioro here in Kenya and many parts of the world. And we want to thank the Lord that you could keep it here at All Saints Cathedral. My name is James Kanye, and I love Jesus Christ, who is my Lord and my Savior. It's a great honor to have an opportunity to bring the Word of God to us. Our theme here at the cathedral has been this year, as even as we start on the first Sunday of the last half of the year, today being Saba Saba, uh, our theme has been, Be Ye Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Actually, it starts by saying, do not, be, do not conform to the standards of this world, but be ye transformed in the renewing of your mind, so that you are able to discern, you are able to know, you are able to fathom the perfect will of God. Uh, and it's taken from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The emphasis for the month of July is, for, is to find joy in the midst of challenges and maintain a perspective focused on the advance, advancement of the gospel. Commit to living out the Christian faith with courage and humility. So, brothers and sisters, we have already finished our exploration of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, and now we have embarked on a new journey as we seek to understand the message in another Pauline letter to the church in Philippi. Our topic today is thanksgiving and prayer, and our reading has already been done. This letter, allow me to con con contain myself to that uh, Pauline letter to the Philippians because it's going to be our focus, I think, for the next two or so months. This letter was written by Apostle Paul himself, and there is no doubt about it. You can see that in chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. Paul visited the city of Philippi in his second missionary journey where his first converts included a business lady called Lydia and her household, and also the Philippian Jaira and his household, among many other people. And that can be seen in the book of Acts, chapter 16, from verse 12 to 16. The epistle is one of the four pouring, uh, popular uh, one of the four popular prison epistles written by Apostle Paul when he was, thought to have been written by Apostle Paul when he was in his first imprisonment at Rome, uh, 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 thought to be uh, between AD 60 and 62. The other three uh, prison epistles are Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. This letter may have been sent to Philippi through Epaphroditus. And you can read that in chapter 2 of Philippians, verse 25, where the Bible says, But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my deeds. And therefore, it is thought that probably this letter go to the church in Philippi through Epaphroditus. The big idea in the entire book of, uh, or letter of Paul to the Philippians is believed to, uh, to, to be an urge by Paul to all believers to live a life worthy the gospel or life worthy the calling that they had received as believers. And scholars have highlighted four purposes of this letter. One of them is to appreciate the gifts from the Philippians, the gifts that the Philippians had sent for the work of the ministry. Number two, Scholars think that the second purpose for this letter is to encourage the Philippian believers to remain faithful to the Lord and to the cause of the gospel. And number three, it's assumed that the letter was meant to reassure the church about Paul's circumstances, even probably as message had spread of his imprisonment, and to promise them to send them Timothy in future. 
And number th- four, it is thought that Paul, probably Paul purposed to write this letter to warn, to warn the church about the false teachers as they prepared for the second coming of our Lord. And there were many people who were teaching different doctrines. In terms of theological relevance, the NIV commentary observes that the most significant passage in this, uh, in this letter is chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, which is called the hymn of Christ. There are people, scholars, who call it the hymn of Christ. Whether it's a hymn or not, it sets Jesus as one to be worshipped and in a remarkable dense form that this supremely divine person descends to a humiliating death on the cross for your and my salvation. And therefore, the letter is primarily not doctrinal like the one that we have done in the book of, uh, the book of Romans, but it focuses on the joy and the gladness that springs from knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 3, verse 8 to 11, you will see the, that theme coming out so strongly. And I believe that as we go through this book in the next two, three months, you will find joy and gladness that you know the Lord. And if you haven't known the Lord, that you will get an opportunity to know the Lord as we explore the book of Philippians or the letter of Paul to the church in Philippi. And therefore, this morning, I have divided my sharing into three uh, small divisions, but I will only do one, and the rest two, we will do it in a form of prayer. That is opening salutations, verse 1 to 2, and that's where I will keep my sharing, and verse 3 to 8, which is thanksgiving, and in 9 to 11, which is a prayer. Opening salutations... Paul allows or fo- uh, follows the, the, the letter writing format of his day. If you look at the way it is addressed, it follows the format of writing a formal letter of those days where the sender started by identifying themselves either formally or informally. And therefore, in chapter 1, verse 1, he starts by saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. I learned two things from this phrase alone. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. Two things. One, why slave and whose slave? We have talked about Apostle Paul and his past life since his conversion. And with the provost did, uh, and I believe he did because I followed uh, uh, his conversation. He did explain what it meant for Paul to introduce himself as a slave or a bored servant. And I believe you still remember how deeply we defined a slave and what it meant to be a a slave. A slave was one who did not know anything, who did not own anything or any right except that which he stewarded for his master. And the reason for Paul to always keep his status in Christ, his new status in Christ on focus, was meant to keep him reminded who he was, and who he belonged. And not to allow anything to overshadow who he really was and who he belonged to. And that all, and that all his achievements were attributable to Christ alone. This has become his identity and his signature. I believe now you can see, as Paul continues to identify and introduce himself as a servant of Jesus Christ or a slave of Jesus Christ, That reminds him, him himself, he reminds him who he is. And I believe now you can start seeing the danger of some of the titles that we hold, like Reverend, you know, Right Reverend, Apostle, Your Excellency, Your Honor, Honorable Mheshimiwa, Sir, when people call you Spiritual Dad, Mommy, you know, mind you, these are all titles given to people's servants. Because the people who hold these titles are people's servants. But the titles themselves have nothing servitude. The title proposes all have nothing servitude in them. And no wonder, a majority of those who hold those titles in trust for the people know nothing about servanthood. And the events of the recent past have made us come back to our senses. The actual owners of the titles that we hold in trust have have come back to call us to accountability. 
So in case you have a title, you have a name, you have an office, or, or something like that, like me, may I be always reminded and never allow my title to cheat me. It is people who call me Reverend. Actually, it is morally wrong for me to call myself Reverend James Mwangi. I should, people should call me. And that should remind me what is expected of me as a servant. If you are Mweshmiwa, that should remind you what is expected of you. Do not allow that to get into your head and forget that you hold it in, in, in trust for the people. Whatever it is in life, hold it in honor and respect. Whether title, whether office, whether position, hold it in respect. And Paul reminded himself as much. Number two, he says, all God's holy people in Jesus Christ at Philippi. Here, Paul says there are many people in Roman colony city of Philippi, like there are people in the city of Nairobi. But Paul addresses specifically those who identify with Christ. That is the church. He sort of isolates them as people with identity and not an anonymous crowd out there without any identity. They have no tribe, color, or age, but all in Christ. This is a deliberate and well calculated call out that was meant to remind believers that one, they were in double occasion. Reminded the believers of their double occasion. They lived at Philippi, like the rest of the Philippians, but they were holy people in Christ, meaning people who belong to God and are incorporated into his service and are free from the old Adam. And number two, even though they were predominantly, uh, predominantly Gentiles, they were set apart for the, from the world in which they lived for God to share in the privileges previously bestowed to God's people, the Jews, in the Old Testament. And therefore, this deliberate call or address is the barrier breaker that through the finished work of Christ on the cross, all of us who believe in him have become children, holy people in Christ Jesus. The way people call you out, you know, like, for example, the way people uh, uh, call us is a precursor of a demand that they, they would like to make on us thereafter. Like, for example, why would people call the provost uh, either the very reverend, or why would they call them, somebody would say, Evans, and not, not, not provost? Because that prepares you to what comes next. I don't know whether you have met people who called you Buona Chairman, Mr. Chairman, and you're not anybody's chairman. Probably, and they even tell you when you get to the restaurants where to sit. Because at the end of the day, they would expect you to pay the bill. That they are preparing you. When, so, when a letter is addressed to the very reverend, it means that it's not addressing Evans. It is addressing the office. Is it that correct? When people call you daddy, mommy, when somebody shouts you mommy, daddy, there's something that they're preparing you for. And therefore, Paul is calling these people out as the uh, holy people, all holy people of God in Christ Jesus to prepare them for what now follows in the next chapters. It is to prepare them to remember that the church, to remind them two things. One, the church or us as the children of God or the Philippians as the children of God are called to influence the environment in which they live. So the Philippians who live, who are in Christ but live it at the city of Philippi, are called to influence their own city or the environment in which they live. And the same case applies to us here. We, the All Saints Cathedral members, we are called to influence the city in which we live. Not to forget ourselves in the environment that we live in. To remind them who they are and who, who they were and who they belong. Not to lose their opportunity to influence and not to lose their identity. The cities of the world have very strong negative influences, most of it negative. The cities set the narrative, they set the agenda, they set the fashion. But the believers are called to set the agenda for God's kingdom. Not to forget that they are God's holy people in Christ living in the city. And they should not uh, uh, lose that chance to influence for Christ with their lives. And number two, to remind the church, to remind the believers of their eternal home. 
that they should not, therefore, treasure earthly things more than the spiritual benefits that await them when Christ is revealed. They should not live as if this world is their home. And this reminder would make them to be what Paul says in chapter 4, verse 1. Be strong and stand firm in the Lord in this way. And for that matter, Paul prays with emotions of joy, gladness, and confidence that they will make it. It is my prayer that the Lord will continue to remind us that, the, that we are his servants. The Lord will continue to remind us that even as we are God's people, we live in a city that we are meant to influence and that we will never allow who we are and what people call us make us forget that we are called to influence the environment in which we live. And this will be the call as we continue in re reading the next chapters, that we are called to live out our faith and to influence our space. Remembering, we belong to the kingdom. And as Paul prayed, may we now pray, and I say a prayer for us. Heavenly Father, on this morning of Saba Saba, when we commemorate the realization of the second political liberation in Kenya, I pray that all God's holy people in Christ at Kenya, and especially for us who are gathered here at All Saints Cathedral, and those who are reasoning your word today, will stand firm. May they receive grace, which is your unmerited favor, to realize what they can't on their own strength. May they know your joy and peace, which are the spiritual benefit of being in Christ, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Esther.